who should receive endovascular therapy or mechanical thrombectomy. So stroke is an important topic. There are about 800,000 cases of stroke per year. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States with about 130,000 deaths per year. It's a leading cause of serious long-term disability and it costs a lot of money. So what is a stroke? Well, a stroke is basically defined as a neurological deficit due to a vascular cause. And the reason it's like that is because a stroke can be either ischemic, which is when there's a blockage of one of the arteries or pipes to the brain, or it can be hemorrhagic, when there's a burst in one of the arteries that leads to hemorrhage within the brain. And I just showed here the sort of three most common types of stroke. One on the left is ischemic, where you have the blockage of an artery and that leads to ischemia or lack of blood and thereby oxygen to the brain and death of tissue. The middle panel is an intracerebral hemorrhage when there's a burst of a blood vessel or pipe to the brain and you have blood. And the third is a subarachnoid hemorrhage where the blood is in the subarachnoid space and that's typically due to a rupture of an aneurysm. And all of these things cause sudden onset neurological deficits and they're all due to vascular causes. And so there are two types of stroke, as I sort of just mentioned, ischemic stroke, which is by far the most common, which is due to an occlusion of a blood vessel that makes up about 85% of all strokes. And there's hemorrhagic stroke, which is the 15%. And that's made up of either intracerebral hemorrhage, where there's a burst of the pipe, blood into the brain tissue itself, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is an aneurysmal rupture. That's the least common cause of stroke, and it's often the most morbid type of stroke when there's an aneurysmal rupture. For this lecture, I'm really gonna be focusing on ischemic stroke, and that's the type of stroke that we use TPA and thrombectomy for. And so when we're talking about acute ischemic stroke, time is brain. Um, about 2 million neurons die each minute during a stroke, and that's why we, we are trying to provide stroke patients with timely therapy to mitigate the risk of damage to the brain when a stroke occurs. That's also why it's really important to educate the public and the community about if you have signs and symptoms of stroke, you need to go to the hospital in order to get these timely medications or therapies. All right, so one of the most important things for ischemic stroke is identifying the last known well time which is the time at which the patient was last seen at their neurological baseline. So that's typically, um, you know, patients who have a stroke, stroke symptoms, again, are sudden onset. But often, for example, patients will wake up with signs and symptoms of stroke. And so when is the last time that they were well? Well, it was the time that they went to bed when they were last seen normal. So if a patient wakes up at 8 a.m. with aphasia and right side weakness, the last known well time is the time they went to bed, let's say 10 p.m. when they were last seen by their you know, loved one as being normal. And that's important because it guides therapy in terms of TPA. And um, we use something called the NIHSS, which is the National Institutes of Health Stroke Scale to measure the severity of stroke. And it's basically a focus screening examination for the assessment of focality of neurological deficits. It's scored between zero and 42, and there are 11 domains of evaluation. Um, so it asks things like, you know, orientation. It asks, you know, for a facial droop, following commands, weakness, sensory loss, um, uh, dysmetry and balance, um, and, uh, and language. And based on that, you can get a very you know, good sense of how bad the stroke is and where the stroke is, the left side, the right side. Um, it's better for anterior circulation strokes. And a score of greater than 10 is more likely to be associated with a proximal vessel occlusion or a large occlusion of a, a blood vessel in the brain. So there are really two effective treatments for acute ischemic stroke. One is intravenous TPA, which is the clot buster, and that's able to be provided up to 4.5 hours from the last known well time. I put an asterisk there because in very recent times, meaning in the last year or so, there have been studies that have pushed that window up to 24 hours. 
Um, and we'll talk about that as well. And then there's endovascular therapy or mechanical thrombectomy, which is basically a minimally invasive surgery where we go into the brain vessel and try to extract the clot. And that can be given up to 24 hours from last known well time. And the easiest way to think of these things is like a plumber, right? If you have a, a, a toilet that's clogged, not to make this about toilets, but that's basically the easiest analogy. If the toilet is clogged, you can do two things. You can provide a medication or Drano, which is like giving some sort of IV medication to try to get rid of the clog. Or you can try to actually go in there and fish out the, the clog. And that's what mechanical thrombectomy is. And those are the two therapies we have for stroke. Um, and so the goal is to unclog a blocked artery. And we either use TPA or thrombectomy to do that. So let's talk about TPA first which is tissue, tissue plasmin, plasminogen activator. And it's basically a medication that's used to break up the blood clot that is clogging the artery and causing a stroke. It's given intravenously, so you do need to set up an IV, and it's given as a bolus and then continuously over one hour. So who should get TPA? Well, you need to think that the patient is having a stroke, and you need to think that the, the symptoms that they're having are disabling, meaning that the symptoms that they're having are going to interfere with their life in some way. And so, for example, someone who has some numbness in their face, that may not be a disabling symptom. Someone who has some weakness in their hand, if they're, you know, a pianist, it's going to be a highly disabling symptom. If they're already bed bound at baseline and they can't move their hands, then having new weakness in their legs or their arms may not be a disabling symptom. And so you have to guide it or gear it um, towards the patient that you're actually taking care of. And it's not a one size fits all um, answer here. In addition to having disabling symptoms, you need to have a stroke symptoms within 4.5 hours. Again, we'll talk about extending that later. And you can't have any major contraindications to giving TPA. Um, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But in general, TPA improves functional outcomes in patients with stroke. And it works up to 4.5 hours. And it's, it's not a therapy that works like you don't, all, you don't usually magically see the patient getting better right away, although sometimes you do. Typically, the better outcome is seen at three months. That's the standard sort of benchmark of evaluating the efficacy of TPA. And there have been many, 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 many trials that have shown that TPA works and the benefit is seen in three months with the idea that it's breaking up you know, pieces of the clot and it's sending those pieces more distally into the brain. And so there's less damage that's done. So what are the questions or tests that need to be done before giving TPA? Well, you need to identify the last known well time. You need to do a non-contrast head CT scan to rule out bleeding. And that's really critical because we as clinicians cannot tell the difference between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke based on clinical measures alone. We need a CT scan to rule out bleeding. Um, that's really uh, essential because you can never assume that the patient is having a ischemic stroke until you get a CT scan that rules out blood. You want to ask about recent events like surgery, trauma, or a bleeding disorder, which might inc may, may increase the risk of bleeding from TPA um, and maybe contraindications to TPA. You want to ask about medications. Do they take a blood thinner? You want to get vital signs. But the only lab that is necessary before giving TPA is a finger stick. And the reason behind that is that severe hyper or hypoglycemia can mimic signs and symptoms of stroke. And so you want to treat that, um, assuming that it's not really a stroke, but it's actually a disorder of blood sugar before giving TPA. You do not need to draw a CBC or a BMP unless you have a clinical suspicion that the patient has some sort of you know, severe metabolic disarray or some bleeding diathesis um, that would pose an increased risk of TPA. So what are the contraindications to TPA? Well, if the patient has evidence of intracranial hemorrhage or internal bleeding, 
don't give TPA because the main risk of TPA is bleeding. If the patient has a recent intracranial or intraspinal surgery or serious head trauma, that's a contraindication. If they have a known bleeding diathesis, if they have severe control, uncontrolled hypertension, or they have the presence of an intracranial lesion that may increase the risk of bleeding, like an aneurysm, a large aneurysm, or a brain tumor, don't give TPA. And time matters when it comes to TPA. The data has shown that the faster you get TPA from symptom onset, the more likely you are to achieve a good outcome. Um, and so this is a very sort of classic figure that's been shown where the y-axis is the odds ratio of achieving an excellent functional outcome. And the x-axis is the time from symptom onset to TPA. And what you can see is that the earlier you get TPA, the better the odds of having an excellent outcome, the further you are from symptom onset to receiving TPA, the less likely, excuse me, the less likely, less likely you are to achieve an excellent functional outcome. And in general, you're 11 times more likely to be helped than harmed by receiving TPA. And so if you imagine 100 patients with an ischemic stroke um, who get TPA, about 30 of them are going to improve and about three of them are going to be harmed, meaning that they're going to have a bleeding or hemorrhage, um, and one of them are, is probably going to die because of it. And so if you take 30 people who are better and three people are worse, you get about 11 or 10 times more likely to be helped than harmed by TPA. Um, I just said that slide. And so the major complication or risk of TPA is bleeding. And it depends on what definition you use, and they're based on different trials. If you take the most generalizable, which is the initial NNES trial from 1995, TPA comes with about a 6% risk of having an intracranial hemorrhage. If you take the ECAS-3 trial, which means that the bleeding has to be symptomatic and cause a worsening in neurological deficits, then approximately only 2% or so of patients will bleed from TPA. And really, if you stick to the guidelines and don't deviate, the risk is probably 2% or less, um, meaning that in general, it is safe. Um, but yes, there are certainly is a risk of bleeding. And when bleeding happens, it can often be very severe. The benefit of TPA, however, is uncertain for patients who have non-disabling symptoms. There was a randomized clinical trial called PRISMS, which basically randomized patients who had non-disabling symptoms to TPA versus placebo, and they found that TPA was no better than placebo for these patients. So most of these patients had isolated numbness, dizziness, a facial droop, and so symptoms that probably in the average patient was not going to affect their quality of life. Um, and so that's why we try to reserve TPA for patients who really have a functional deficit as a result of their stroke in whom TPA could be beneficial at reducing that benefit and improving outcomes. So TPA should be given for, given for disabling neurological deficits. Examples include dominant hand weakness, a field cut, aphasia, neglect. But again, it really is a personalized um, approach not every patient is the same. And so you have to sort of gear it to that specific patient who's in front of you, who you're making decisions for. How do we provide TPA? It is not a consent. You don't need to get them to sign a form. It is an assent process. Basically you explain, you know, patient is having a stroke, which was we think due to a blockage of an artery of the brain. There's a medication called TPA, which helps to break down the clot. TPA is associated with 11 times more likely to be helped than harmed. There is a risk of bleeding. The benefit of TPA decreases with time. So the sooner that we're able to treat you, the better. Do you have any questions? That's typically the thought process and how I and you know, my colleagues sort of treat patients with stroke um, and provide information and assent for TPA. Of course, the patient and or family can refuse TPA or decline it, um, but um, if they're not available, then it is the standard of care and we will give TPA.
So what about patients who wake up with strokes? So this is a new data from the wake up trial, which was performed a few years ago. I said in the beginning that we always for the last several decades have assumed that if a patient goes to bed at 10 p.m. and wakes up at 8 a.m. with symptoms of stroke, their last known well time is the time they went to bed. And so they would not be eligible for TPA because they're out of the 4.5 hour window. However, that always assumed the worst, that their stroke symptoms might have happened the moment they went to bed. But data actually suggests that patients are actually more likely to have a stroke in the morning hours when there's a catecholamine surge. And so in reality, these patients may have had a very recent stroke and, and actually could benefit from TPA. And so this trial looked at um, patients who were wake up from strokes or had a stroke beyond 4.5 hours who had imaging evidence that suggested that their stroke was recent. And so they did that by looking at something called a DWI flare mismatch, um, which meant that there was positivity on DWI without positivity on flare. Flare, uh, DWI typically becomes positive when, within minutes of a, a stroke, whereas flare takes about six hours. And so this mismatch represents that the stroke probably occurred within that six hour window. Similarly here, there's DWI positivity and no positivity on flare. On the other hand, no DWI mismatch means that there's positive here, positive there, positive here, positive there. And these patients probably had a stroke beyond six hours of onset. And so this trial evaluated TPA versus placebo for patients who had this mismatch where they likely were having a stroke within six hours of onset. And they found that TPA was indeed associated with a beneficial outcome and that these patients with wake up strokes could indeed benefit from TPA. Um, however, there was an increased risk of harm. There was a greater risk of death and 90 days in the patients who, had, uh, who received TPA. And so the most recent American Heart Association guidelines suggest that we can use MRI to look for this mismatch and that TPA should be used in select patients um, who have wake up strokes who are beyond 4.5 hours. And that's a new recommendation. And we've used it, I think now twice here at Cornell in the last couple of years, which means that it's rare. We don't do it very much, but certainly it's in our armamentarium now. So the summary of TPA is that TPA is beneficial up to 4.5 hours from the last known well time. The sooner you receive, the sooner from symptom onset to receiving TPA, the better the chance of a good outcome. And that TPA may be beneficial in select patients beyond 4.5 hours of last known well time with favorable advanced imaging profiles. But what's the problem? Well, TPA has a narrow time window. It only recanalizes or opens up the artery in about 45% of the time. And there's various exclusionary factors as we went over, like recent surgery, coagulation abnormalities, history of hemorrhage. And so the next step is let's actually get the clot out. So just like I mentioned in the beginning, we can use Drano or TPA, or we can manually try to fish out that clot like a plumber and actually go into the brain, into the artery and take out the clot. Um, and here's just to really drive home the point of there's a clogged pipe. And so we need to get that clog out. Um, and the goal really is to reopen the artery. Um, and that's the goal from either TPA or thrombectomy. So recanalization happens spontaneously in about a quarter of patients. TPA increases it to about almost 50%, but in those who have a major occlusion of a big artery, TPA only works probably in 10 to 15%, which is a lot lower. But mechanical thrombectomy, which is the actual surgery that we're gonna talk about where you go into the brain and remove the clot, achieves recanalization in you know, 80 plus percent of the time. Um, and so the goal is to do a, a catheterization procedure, um, which can use a stent device and remove the blood clot from the artery that's causing the stroke. 
Typically we go into the femoral artery. Sometimes we'll go into the radial artery, we'll go all the way up into the aorta, uh, to the heart, to the aorta, and then into the carotid artery and into the brain and remove that clot. And so the first trial that showed that mechanical thrombectomy was efficacious for stroke was the Mr. Clean trial that was performed in the Netherlands. And this was published in 2015. They basically took patients who had something called a large vessel occlusion, which means that there was an occlusion of one of the major arteries of the brain, the internal carotid in the head, the middle cerebral or the anterior cerebral artery. And they ran, oops, they randomized patients to usual care, which was TPA or medical management versus usual care plus intraarterial therapy, which for most patients was mechanical thrombectomy. And this is just sort of the schematic of what happens. In A, you can see these are the blood vessels and you can see there's an abrupt cutoff here. There's no blood flow flowing here. Um, and so this is them using the stent to go in to this blocked artery. And then here you can see the resolution. If you compare A to C, all these new blood vessels have re-emerged, meaning that the clog has been removed and there's new blood flow into these arteries of the brain. And here's the blood clot that's removed from the brain. And, and mechanical thrombectomy was shown to significantly improve outcomes in these patients. And so 33% of patients achieved an excellent outcome versus 19% in the controls. And if you add MRS of three, more than 50% of patients achieved a good outcome as compared to the control patients. And so taken together, this showed that mechanical thrombectomy was an effective strategy at improving outcomes in patients with large vessel occlusions. Um, and this basically showed that recanalization was much better in thrombectomy versus medical management. 75% of patients achieved thrombectomy in the thrombectomy group versus 30 something percent in the controls. And there was a significantly smaller infarct volume in the thrombectomy group compared to the controls. The results of Mr. Clean have now been upheld in multiple subsequent randomized clinical trials. There's Mr. Clean, which was in the Netherlands, Extend, which was Australia, Escape, which was global, Swift Prime, which was US and Europe, and Reviscat, which was Spain. And they all found the same thing, but um, some of them are more complicated than others, um, basically all indicating that thrombectomy is a successful and, and an efficacious strategy to improve outcomes with stroke in patients who have a large vessel occlusion. So based on the Mr. Clean trial um, and other trials, the AHA guidelines changed in 2015 and now recommend thrombectomy to be performed in patients with acute ischemic stroke who have a proximal vessel occlusion who have a normal baseline, who are an adult, who have a stroke scale above five, and who can be treated within six hours of symptom onset. The role of TPA is now unclear in patients with thrombectomy. And so there have now been several different trials there. Um, and sometimes TPA can that yes, thrombectomy can be used in patients who are beyond six hours from last known well time based on radiographical parameters, picking the right candidate for therapy. And so they base this on something called penumbra, which is a salvageable tissue. And what that means is that if this is the artery of the brain and this black represents a clogged artery or blocked artery, it blocks blood flow to the tissue that the artery supplies. 
And often what happens is that there's a core area of infarct. That's an area of brain tissue that is dead and never coming back. It is completely deprived of blood for a long enough period of time that it is unsalvageable. But there's another potentially bigger area of brain called a penumbra, which may die if nothing is done to remove this clot, but that area is supplied by collateral blood flow from other arteries and is, is helping to um, preserve this brain tissue and um, will die if we don't remove this clot, um, but can potentially be saved if we remove this clot. And so the whole point of delayed thrombectomy is to treat and save this penumbral tissue. So DAWN was a study where they looked at patients between six and 24 hours after stroke onset. They had to have a pretty decent stroke scale score. They had to have a proximal brain vessel occlusion, and they had to have something called a clinical infarct mismatch, meaning that they had to have a relatively bad clinical exam, but a minimal, completely dead core infarct volume on brain imaging. So they compared standard of care to thrombectomy, and they found that there was a significant benefit of thrombectomy compared to standard of care in patients who underwent this delayed thrombectomy. And those results held true in all of their subgroup analyses. Diffuse 3 looked at thrombectomy between 6 and 16 hours and specifically used perfusion imaging to guide therapy. So unlike Dawn, where there had to be a clinical infarct mismatch, this was purely about radiography. And so they looked at um, whether the they, look, they basically compared and contrasted the core infarct versus the penumbra infarct. Um, and so this is what they did. They looked at, for example, in someone who had a left middle cerebral artery occlusion, they looked at the ischemic core, which again is the completely dead tissue that is never coming back, in this case, 23 cc's. And they looked at the per perfusion lesion or the penumbra. Um, which is the area that will die if the, the occlusion of the brain is not retrieved. And so in this case, it's 120 c to 8 cc's. And so there's a mismatched volume, 100 cc's, meaning that you're never going to get back this 20 cc's of brain. But if you act now, you could potentially save 100 cc's of brain tissue. And so they targeted these patients who had a large mismatch, mismatch volume, and they found that delayed thrombectomy significantly improved outcomes in those patients, um, suggesting that you can use this penumbral perfusion imaging to guide therapy in, in treating these patients. And so based on these two trials, in 2018, the uh, guidelines were revised and basically said that between six and 16 hours, um, or six and 24 hours, you can use either the DAWN or the diffuse criteria to guide therapy and perform delayed thrombectomy. So basically the summary here is that acute onset of stroke within 4.5 hours or disabling deficits, you should get TPA. If the stroke onset is within six hours and there's a proximal large vessel occlusion and a stroke scale of six or higher, you should do mechanical thrombectomy. If the stroke is within 24 hours, and you have a proximal large vessel occlusion and a favorable mismatch profile, you should do thrombectomy. And as we sit here today, you should give TPA if a patient is, it has a stroke within 4.5 hours, even if they're gonna undergo thrombectomy as long as there's no contraindication. And so with that, I'm going to stop here and answer any questions that you guys might have.